about the parable of the master and servant. Um, And here, I'm going to share with you a few ways you can get connected. And I'll start by mentioning our movement, which is a fitness club that meets every Monday and Wednesday at 530. And it is open to everyone, whether you're experienced going to a workout class or not. Um, And uh, John Gonzalez runs that class. And I don't see him in here today, but... Oh, there he is. Sorry, I'm used to you being up there. So there's John. Um, (laughs) Yay, John. And we also have a... um, our restorative rhythms, it's normally the first Monday of every month, but bef- because of the holiday, we moved it to the second week, and so it's tomorrow, right, Mumbi? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this one. So it's like a gentle yoga um, guided meditation, and if you um, are in need of child care for that, please let me know ahead of time, and we will find a teenager to watch your kids. (laughs) So um, also something exciting coming up is um, we're calling it uh, a salad party work day. So this month has five Sundays. And um, instead of a more traditional gathering, we'll be hosting a work day potluck with a summer salad contest. So whatever salad means to you, whether that's greens or potatoes or eggs or jello, salad is salad. So we're going to have a first place, second place, third place winner. Um, If you want to bring a dish to enter, there's um, a code so you can enter your your salad dish. And we're just going to help spruce this place up. That's what we mean by work day. It's not a lot of work if we all, what are they, what's the saying? Many hands make light work. So we'll get some stuff done and we'll enjoy salad and fellowship. Um, Next, if you'd like to stay in the loop, uh, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly newsletter. You just scan the code and you can get our email every week. And people often ask how they can help. First of all, this community is funded exclusively through our financial donations. um, And summers are usually the most leanest. Uh, Hi. Sorry, my friend just walked in. Um, Well, you really threw me off, Jen. (laughs) It's okay. Um, But... uh, So in regards to giving and attendances, most everyone's schedules are blessedly interrupted by plans and vacations. So just please remember to give as you're able, and we thank you so much for all of your donations. And secondly, if you want to help us get the word out, you can check our new information center at the beginning of the hallway. Um, The cards make really great invitations, and if you know someone who might who you might want to bring or invite to something, they are really handy. So, yeah. And that's, that's that for the announcements. Yay. Well, thank you. Smattering of applause. All right, I need a second to get ready. So um, why don't you guys talk amongst yourselves for just a moment? I'll give you a topic. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Just, you know, say, say hi to each other for a second, and then I'll, I'll call us all back together in just a minute. You don't have to. You know, you can just look down or something. If that makes you feel uncomfortable, that's fine.
All right. Okay. Uh, good morning. How is everyone? You good? Feeling more uh, more introspective than than social this morning? Yeah. I thought. I mean, either one's a solid answer. Um. All right. Well, let's let's take just a second to um to collect ourselves. That's what I'm going to do. And and by that I mean just um, just give yourself a moment to to settle into your seat wherever it is that you happen to be, and allow yourself to be aware of your your body, the space around us. Allow yourself to be aware of how you're feeling, what you're thinking about, sort of what you've brought with you into this place. And if you'd like, you can take a few deep breaths and just kind of loosen up, you know, like we're, we're allowed to let go of whatever we'd like to let go of. So now's a good time just to relax, let it go. ask for the grace to be just as present as possible, as collected within our own self, as undivided as we're able to be in this moment, so aware of ourselves, aware of each other, most of all aware of the presence of God at the deepest part of who we are. And we'll ask for the grace that for these next moments we get to share with each other, that that this experience is, is shared from that deepest place, so that the words spoken and the words heard are coming from the same place. And we're very grateful to be to be here. It's in your name that we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. This is part 12 of, um, of a series called Parabola that we started some time back. And um, I got to tell you, man, these parables, they just keep getting weirder. They, they defy all, I mean, as far as I can tell, I don't know, maybe I'm reading them wrong, but I just, they're, they're so difficult to simplify, and so many of the easy answers, um, you really have to do some, some hard work to make the easy answers fit. You know, you're kind of a surface reading, you, oh, yeah, I know what that means, it's some kind of this, that. And the more time you spend with these things, the more uh, funny, subtle, you know, all it takes is one word, really, to disrupt the whole explanation. And, um, and cause you to spend a little bit more time uh, with the stories than, you know, than we usually feel like we, like we have time for, you know. Like what Bet said, she's, she said, uh, we trust that it's going to go slowly. And then there's this fear, like, oh, no, <laughs> I don't like slow, you know. Like, <laughs> uh, all right, let's, let's look at this morning's parable. It's the master and servant. And it's told in Luke 17, 7 through 10. All right, you ready for this one? All right, this is Jesus. He says, listen, suppose one of you has a servant that's plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink. After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant? because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you've done everything you were told to do, you should say, we are unworthy servants. We've only done our duty. (laughs) So, uh, you know, what's your immediate reaction to that? What do you think? What's it? A little harsh. A little edge on it. Yeah, like there's something in you that's like, hold now, hold on, Justice. I remember... uh, I was in a staff meeting one time. 
um, with a different company in a faraway land. But uh, um, somebody was was lamenting to the uh, to the person in charge that they never got were like thanked for their contributions to the group, and the person in charge <laughs> said, um, uh, "I sign your paycheck every week, don't I?" And we all went, "Well, no, 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 that's not." That's not how it works. Like, you have to also say nice things. And he was like, I don't think you do. So that's, not how, that's not how my life was growing up. I don't know. And there's probably a time when the general reaction to this story would have just been like, oh, yeah, it would have been obvious. You know, we're not really living in such a time anymore. It's kind of like, sheesh. Because your mind, you know, it's a story coming from the scriptures as credited to Jesus. And so we're naturally, um, you know, this, this pattern recognition software in our minds kicks up and we're, we're immediately trying to figure out, like, what the spiritual lesson is here. So the person with power has to be God, and that would be, right? And then the servant has to be us. And so then we think, oh, that's, that's how God wants to treat his kids. Um, I think it's really interesting when you read... Uh, you know, Jesus spent, like, he had a popular message, you know, like crowds followed him. There were healings and miracles, but there was also uh, an unusual and an unlikely, uh, the, the playing field, as far as Jesus could tell, was, was level. The, the hierarchies weren't phony. He took time to tell the folks who felt they'd been cursed, had been told they were cursed, that they're actually blessed. All the things that separate and divide, right? he often pointed to their inherent phoniness. He told people that they are the salt of the earth, that they are the light of the world, that you're made in the image and likeness of God, the divine image, and that nothing can change or alter that. That you're... A, God's beloved child held in the imagination of God before time began. And then he'd also tell stories like this one that appear to have the, the express written content to just like shred your ego, you know? So you say, how do you balance these two, these two things? A lot of these stories and a lot of his comments um, circled around whatever this impulse is, this, this thing that our that all of our collective ego naturally does, which is um, to determine if something that's occurring is fair or unfair. That's, that's kind of where our sense of justice comes from. Uh, is this fair or is this unfair? And Jesus told a lot of stories like this one that are just kind of like, I, you know. Why is this? Why such aggression? No, really, what do you think? You hear, all right, you hear this story. What is the benefit of internalizing and accepting this story as it affects your life? <laughs> yep. Mm. Right. That's good. Mm. Some, some people. Uh, the most helpful thing that they could hear is something to humble, to ground out, and others need to be lift up, lifted up, and both of them are in me. Anything else?
everybody thinks the same way. Yeah. And that balance of um, you're already blessed just by being here. You've been breathed into life by God. You're here. There's no accidents. And, and then uh, at the same time, uh, yeah, like, you know, you'd, like, um, I remember one time somebody came to visit us from Canada, and they said as soon as they crossed the border into Florida, all that, uh, they were already, they'd already, said they had already had um, billboard fatigue, you know, from driving down the highway. And then as soon as they crossed the border into Florida, he, he said all the billboards are, are uh, lawyers. They're all like these kind of like, you know, bit by a dog, call. And, um, and so I remember. <laughs> Uh, you know, and a lot of times those, those billboards and the commercials on it, they're like, um, get what you deserve. All right, that I always think, I don't even know if I want that. Huh? So, so our, our ego that, that does really sort of um, exist in this realm of uh, entitlement and Maybe some self-righteousness, fear-generated sense of separation. Um, the ego lives in the mind, and what we now know, this is pretty recent, um, through neurological studies, what neuroscience has proven, is that, um, that our minds work um, in these little categories. The neuroscientists call them semantic neighborhoods. And they're basically little bins in our mind where input, because there's so much coming in all the time, you know, so input is grouped together for efficiency's sake and thrown in these little categories, bins, neighborhoods. And it's a survival mechanism. And it allows us to quickly tell the difference between like a bird or a shark or a hammer or who it is that happens to be holding the hammer. I hit my dad's thumb with a hammer not that long ago. And I, you know, I think he might have me in the wrong semantic neighborhood. <laughs> but this... This, uh, this pattern recognition software that our, that our mind is developed for that's, that's been um, uh, growing and establishing itself for thousands and thousands and thousands of years um, sort of rushes to put things into neat categories so that a response can be made quickly and efficiently. And what this means, I mean, what we're being shown is that we're biologically predisposed to think and snap judgments. Which is to say to simplify and reduce like everything, all the things, everything, all the input. The first impulse is to simplify and reduce into neat categories. And this leads to what Jesus was always pointing out. That it's possible to look without ever really seeing. And to hear without ever really listening and to learn without ever really knowing. And the actual problem inherent to categorization, like the snap judgment, and all the categories, good, bad, in, out, fair, unfair, righteous, unrighteous, the actual problem inherent is our deeply ingrained tendency to believe that we can tell them apart, that, that our perspective is the accurate one, like Candace said. Well, not everybody thinks the same way I do. Which, you know, generally, you've got to watch yourself, man, because the, 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 you know, well, they don't see it the way that I do, which there's this little thing in you that's like, which is the right way. <laughs> you know? I'll try to be tolerant of their naivety. You know? Like. <laughs> this writer, David Foster Wallace, is sometimes attributed with coining the phrase that the mind is a wonderful servant but a terrible master. The issue here isn't the programming. The programming's here to help us. The issue is that the programming wants us to believe that it's the only thing we are. In his commencement speech um, he gave in 2005, he said, the choice of what to think about is essentially our greatest power. What to think about. Because the exact same experience can mean two totally different things to two different people. So the only thing that's capital T true is that you get to decide how you're going to try to see whatever it is that you're seeing. It's been said that 
that what you're seeing is significantly less important than where you're seeing from. Coming to terms with that restores or enables or allows us to have that choice, to have a choice. Instead of just living what feels like our life, but is actually just all these deeply ingrained patterns playing themselves out. That's like the benefit of being close to somebody is that you make a move that you sense to be pretty original and unique, and if somebody knows you well enough, they could have seen it coming like a week ago. You know, if you punched in the scenario, they'd say, this is what they'll do. But, you know, having that reflected back to you is generally, you have a mixed feeling, right? It's kind of like hearing this parable. You're like, don't be so mean. <laughs> unless, unless our orientation is to transformation, Once we begin to make peace with the fact, to accept, to see that that this whole thing, this whole experience, I mean, you know, what's the meaning of life? As, as far as I can tell, we've been placed here under very difficult circumstances to learn how to love. And to love means self-surrender. You know, we have this term unconditional love, and most of us feel like that's the highest ideal, unconditional love. And then we go about our way in life and are put into situations where we can either fight for our rights, right? Sometimes this is appropriate. A lot of times fighting for our rights just illustrates how very conditional my unconditional love for you is. So if what we're doing here is experiencing a pretty harsh environment, I mean, it's, kind of, it's hard to make it out here, you know? Everything's all heavy. And <laughs> most rooms are too small for me. I'm always running into things. And the whole, like, it's so dense. Situations never go the way, very rarely do they go the way that you thought they would go. And then oftentimes when they, wait, when they go the way that you hoped they would go, you find out that the answer isn't in there. It didn't quite do the thing you thought it was going to be. You know, this is, it's like a, it's a, and then there's the actual pain in this life that we've all been touched by. And then there's the fear of the pain, which wisdom tells us is often worse than the pain itself. You know, the way that we live out worst case scenarios so that if the worst case scenario does come true, we've already lived it nine times, you know. And it still hurts. It's not, it's, not, it's not an easy thing to do to be a human being. And we can be frustrated about this. This is one, this is the most easy paradigm to adopt for most of us. Or <laughs> this is it's kind of a silly example, but one time I heard somebody say, um, like, you don't mind getting pelted in the face with snow if what you're doing is training to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. If this is the goal, then the snow in the face may be uncomfortable, but you can deal with it. But if your plan is just, like, watch Netflix and somebody comes in and hits you in the face with a snowball, you're a lot more angry. <laughs> C.S. Lewis got this thing. Uh, it's on our fridge, but it's like we, we have to stop. We have to stop seeing the interruptions and the difficulties in life. The unexpected and the difficult as interruptions in life and begin to see that the interruptions, uh, that the, um, the difficulties and the places, the things that make us um, unexpected, unexpectedly uncomfortable are real life. It's to accept is to be open to change and to be open to change is to grow. And to grow is to become free. And that's what we're doing here. Yeah, so one of the biggest barriers to, to growth, one is what we're talking about here, the perspective that we have, what it is that we're doing here. It's, it's nice to know some sense of what that is, though it will change inevitably. What I'm doing here and what I think I'm doing here is not anything close to what I thought I was doing here 
five years ago. And I hope in five years I'll say the same thing. You know, I don't really know that the landing spot is, is the goal. There just has to be some framework. Another barrier to transformation, um, and it's one that Jesus touches on often, is this, um, this snap judgment, this rush to judgment, this easy categorization. Here's something interesting. The word category, our English word, comes from the Greek word categoria. Not much of a difference there. It must be close in meaning. Categoria translates literally to accusation, to speak against. But it makes sense. Any category, the categories exist um, depending on how we understand them in opposition to each other. Like there's no in unless there's an out. There's no good unless there's a bad. There's no saved unless there's an unsaved. There's no righteous unless there's an unrighteous. There's no us without a them. Some part of our mind tells us. And this rush to judgment, this categorization, these accusations, is what Jesus was forever cautioning the Pharisees about. He said, he said don't judge or you're going to be judged too. And he didn't mean by God. The, the context there was human relationship. Jesus says, don't judge or you'll also be judged. For in the same way that you judge others, you too will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured out to you. This is what he was warning them about. And he spoke in really harsh, direct language to the Pharisees. Most of the stuff when you're like, ooh, that's pretty mean, it was, it was in Jesus' conversation with the Pharisees. And it seems like he is saying in some way, if the only way that, the only possibility for your heart to soften enough that you can begin to accept and receive the love that's already present, if the only way the heart is softened, can't be softened with this degree of black and white thinking shielding it, then I will speak to you in black and white terms until we can move into a language closer to truth. He says, don't go around judging everybody else because you know what will happen? They're going to start judging you. And nobody likes being judged. And this is the, this is the, here's the funny thing, right? <laughs> this is the funny thing about judgment. So Jesus warns the Pharisees not, not to do that. They kind of go about their way judging. And now we're here we are 2,000 years later, and they're sort of the, the, the black villains of the piece, you know? Like, we're like, oh, look at these nasty Pharisees giving Jesus a hard time again. Self-righteous little religious buggers. And Pharisees go into the bad guy bin category. And we go, <laughs> we go, look at this Pharisee. He's saying, thank God I'm not like him. And we're going, thank God I'm not like him, saying, thank God I'm not like him. It's funny hanging out with hippies because we say things like, I only hang out with people who are open-minded. <laughs> I don't know. Can you turn it off? Can you stop thinking? No, it just kind of keeps going. Is anything the practice of meditation has taught me, it's that this guy, it just, it just won't stop. So you know what? All right. Party on. But I'm not coming with you to every party. There's a story where the Pharisees bring this woman to Jesus, and it's titled A Woman Caught in Adultery, but it really should be titled like Men Being Rude and Domineering. <laughs> and they say, look, we caught her. She's busted. The scriptures say that she needs to be killed. I don't, you know, where the guy is, you slip into the crowd. It takes two to tango. And Jesus' response is, you judge by outer appearances. Not, I judge the heart. It's not kind of what we'd expect him to say. He says, I don't judge anybody. This, this perspective of non-judgment, of, of acknowledging the, the mind's rush to, to categorize um, and not labeling or judging that also, right? It's just, it's a, man, 
further down the rabbit hole. If only I could get my mind to stop judging everything. I judge my mind with. You just see it's a function, and it's helpful in some situations, and it gets out of control, and it attempts to dominate our entire perspective when just beyond it, just underneath it, always more subtle, very rarely does a perception that's in line with what Jesus described the kingdom of God, the way that, as best as we can know, the way that God sees and experiences reality. Have you ever thought about how non-judgmental God must be? I mean, look at patient. I don't know what word you want to use here. I think, you know, in the, in the Genesis, in the creation narrative, I was struck by this the other day, um, but God just, he, he, it's, it's like the, all the language in creation is passive. It's, it's let there be. Let there be. It's like God is, is allowing these things to happen, to unfold the way that they do. He didn't make the earth. He allowed the earth. He doesn't make our circumstances. He allows them. When we harmonize with this ourselves, instead of fighting against what we're seeing, learning to say, well, God allows it, and so I will allow it to, and at least see what it feels like to allow it. This is a different perspective, and it opens up a reality that is so much lighter. And from this perspective, Jesus says things like this. He goes, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And be like your Father in heaven, who causes his Son to rise on the evil, the good, sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Here are all these labels and categories. Enemy, evil, good, righteous, unrighteous. I saw a food truck not that long ago that said nacho business. <laughs> so the scriptures, the same scriptures that really do spend a lot of time reinforcing these labels, also regularly explode them, and I feel like, you know, it's sort of like the, one of those choose-your-own-adventure things. I don't know where the life is for you. I, I can tell where it is for me, um, as far as I can tell. And there is, well, there's two things happening. The scriptures never allow us to rush to easy answers. They're constantly in balance, man, and that's why people <laughs> have been fighting about these things. Um, and mutually excommunicating each other and allowing relationships to disintegrate. <coughs> Arguing over things that nobody really knows and that even the book won't resolve. <coughs> so the scriptures say a lot that, that can reinforce this idea of labels and categories. It also regularly explodes them um, St. Paul has a few things to say that I find fascinating. Uh, first of all, he quotes, um, he quotes a, a, what's it called, a pagan poet. This is really interesting to me as far as, like, um, as far as truth in scripture goes. This is just really interesting. He, he quotes like, um, well, he quotes somebody else. And he also says funny things like, um, Right now, it's not, it's not the Lord speaking, but Paul. Like, you can turn it on and off, but that's in the Bible, too. Anyway, quick aside. He quotes a poet of his day, and he says, this seems to be accurate, that it is in God that we live and that we move and that we have our being. That we all share in the same life. And that the same God who breathed us into existence, that it's impossible for God to be anywhere except for where we are. I used to have a concept of hell, that hell is, the, hell is where God isn't. 
I was taught that, and that seemed true. And one day, my uh, my son, he was so young then, he was like three or something, and he, he asked me about hell, and I gave him that answer, and he didn't say anything for, and then he goes, I don't think there's anywhere where God isn't. And I thought, that seems true. It's in God that we live and move and have our being. It's shared. And then he goes on to say this. This is Colossians 3 and Galatians 3. He goes, in light of this, there is neither Jew or Gentile. Those are, that would be national identity, political party. There isn't slave or free. This would be your, there's no social status. There's no circumcised or uncircumcised. This would be religious standing. There's no barbarian or civilized. This would be socioeconomic standing. Nor is there male or female, your gender. In light of eternity, in this place that exists within, around the label-making machine, the out-of-control label-making machine. <laughs> One summer, when I, uh, I've, um, <laughs> I've worked here for a long time, and when I was just a whippersnapper and was first hired, uh, I was the janitor slash receptionist slash uh, move the chairs around in the rooms guy. And uh, one time somebody uh, um, had this note, like, here's the thing about a, a shared space. You know, the idea of this, this place still to this day, and, and hopefully even more so, is that this, the theaters here, this place we get to occupy, first of all, it's a really cool place. Like, yeah, I used to, thank you. Light smattering of applause. Yeah. Well, sorry. I, was, I wasn't trying to make that happen. It wasn't like a put a quarter in the machine and get a better round of applause. <laughs> Let me hear this side. Um, <laughs> you know, I used to just see all the leaks and the this and the that, and there's no windows. Man, 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 man. You know, it's expensive. Man, man, man. And then, uh, you know, this last year, year and a half here, um, as Jess and myself and Sullivan's and the Huberts and Sprinkles and all too many people to name or count have really gotten in to this place and like cleaned it, and cared for it, cozied it up. Like I found myself just totally falling in love with it. I feel like I'm the custodian of the legacy of this building. And you know, eventually, I, Barring a miracle, eventually the Hilton or somebody will purchase this, and they will plow it and build some resort with dolphins you can swim with and <laughs> water slides, and this, this beautiful, crusty old building will be nothing but a memory. Um, <laughs> but we just signed a seven-year lease, so there's a chance, right? So we... I don't, is this a positive outlook? I'm not sure, but I, lately I just feel like I love you, little building. You know, like it's kind of like in, in hospice care, and I just want it to like go out <laughs> calmly and peacefully and knowing that it's held, even if it takes 30 years, who knows, you know. Eventually, something's going to knock it over. Oh, anyway, I don't, yeah, that was not at all what I was trying to talk about. What I was trying to say was that Having a shared space, like a group, like a living room for everybody, like what happens is like, you know how at home you're like, don't the spoons go in this drawer? Where do the spoons go? And there's only like five of you there and still things get moved. Well, now there's like 150 of us. So stuff goes everywhere. So any one summer, this somebody who is in charge around here had a label maker and they decided that if we just labeled everything, everything, labeled them all, labeled everything, label it, label it, label it, nothing will get lost. And so I can't tell you how many hours I put in labeling things. And then, um, and then everything got lost again. <laughs> These words that we use to describe values that feels so deeply important to our sense of self, who we are and where we've come from and what we have and what we wish we had. And 
what religion we belong to and what political party we affiliate with, what kind of shirts we wear, I don't even know, how I do my hair, my interests, things I like, the things I don't like, my gender, right? All of it. None of it is real. From a certain perspective that feels a lot like freedom, we can see that even if it is so profoundly, deeply felt, nothing, none of them are permanent. And in light of this is this incredible invitation to freedom, because to get out from under the weight of our roles, like the expectations that we have for ourselves or the expectations that we feel others have are placed on us, the stuff you just have to do, you know? The most incredible thing happens when we experience what it is to be out from underneath those roles. Um, it's a lot like, like, like being out of jail, I suppose. And it's interesting to find out that it's like you had the key the whole time. And that the things that you thought that they really needed you to do and that if you don't do it, you're going to be in big trouble or it won't happen. It has to get done. And if I don't do it, then nobody's going to do it. And you just like all these, you let it go. And life, God, shows us over and over again that what's meant to be will happen. And who you actually are is only revealed as you let go of who it is you think you're meant to be. Now, you don't have to say this out loud unless you want to, but you know, what, what is your most deeply felt role or roles? What do you sense to be critical to not only your sense of self-identity, but also like maybe your purpose in this world, you know? A great-grandparent, oh, that's nice. Humble and faithful and kind. Oh, that's different. That's a different kind of role, isn't it? <laughs> this guy, this, this, this joker over here that just said that, Garrett, my friend, I was telling him one day about, about this kind of stuff, and, and, um, and I was talking to him, this was years, years ago, and I was telling him, I was like, well, what do you, I mean, there's nothing to stand on. Like, every time I think there's something to stand on, it's like the, the door drops out, you know? And, like, some of the things that we build are really beautiful. And so if none of it's real, what's the point of any of it, you know, this kind of thing? And Garrett, he said, uh, he said, um, oh, listen, you can, you can build whatever you'd like and put your whole heart into it and make it as solid and firm as you can. And then also realize that it is falling through space and emptiness like everything else. And then somebody got into a car accident, and he ran from our table where we were having coffee and pulled somebody out of a vehicle. Literally, that happened, like, right after that. It was like a, hanging out with Captain America or something. Uh, getting out from the weight of these roles and expectations and labels and categories. And I think a fair case can be made that, that the bulk of our experience of suffering in this life isn't, it's not the things that happen to us, it's just our ideas of what ought to be happening to us. We overlay our experience of reality with our expectations of what it ought to be or ought not to be. And that perspective, well, it hurts. 
So getting out from the weight of, the, you know, getting out of the cage of these, these roles, these identity pieces. Um, is the most painful experience I've ever had in my life, and I think you would agree yourselves. Uh, the, like the, I, to, to me, the, the core of the Christian message, what I, how I read it and understand it, is this um, coming to terms with the ultimate pattern in reality, which is that, that resurrection, like real life, to be born again, which is to be awake in your life, to experience freedom and harmony, to know what it is to be held and carried and cared for, to know that you can't properly name what that experience is, in the best words, can't touch it, to be here and content. Resurrection life, the life that's truly life, to be born again, is preceded always by death. And we, we don't get to go around the pain to the victory. You even need both sides of the church to balance some of this out, you know, because the Protestants, we got Jesus off the cross as quick as he could, and the Catholics, they left him on there. We need both reminders. To let go of some of these things. <laughs> Man. Like this is, this is probably a weird thing for a pastor to say, which probably makes it the ideal example. Because, you know, pastor is just a, just a role I, for a number of years there, I mean, I couldn't tell what I believed. Everything blew up. I didn't really want it to blow up. I was pretty happy with it. And after it exploded, my uh, map of reality, you know, kind of like disintegrated, um, I, I, got, I got very busy developing a unified theory for everything that would accommodate all this new information and allow me to keep being a Christian. And I work really hard on it, and I've told you guys a story before, but I just thought and thought and thought and thought and read and read and read and talked and talked and talked and thought and thought and thought and read and read and read. And one morning I woke up, and I woke up to myself thinking my brain I don't know where I was, but my brain was still cracking the code, and I was like, this is not cool, man. I was losing hair, losing sleep. Um, and I, the only way to describe it is that right around the time I thought, I might not, I'm a pastor of a church, but I might not be a Christian. I began to see that I think I, in the course of that process and then that recognition I, and then the immediate aftermath, I realized, I think I just became a Christian. Right, the only time in my entire life when people were questioning my loyalty and allegiance and theology and, you know, the only time, I'm not, I'm not a controversial person. And the only time I've ever had that experience, are you following Jesus? That was happening simultaneous to me internally feeling like, I think I just started actually following Jesus. <laughs> this is a strange thing. As soon as I began to make peace with the fact that I would, I, I'm probably not the one to find a unifying theory, you know, <laughs> and that maybe I would just never understand any of this stuff. something like understanding started to grow. And so what's, what's, I don't know, required, helpful 
into our journey of being formed, made, revealed into the likeness of God's Son. To learning to be in this world what we actually already are, child of God. Is a new way of seeing, and I it just, I've said it here already, but um, the only way to see something that was already there. <laughs> One time I was okay. One time I was doing a little construction project, um, and I was almost done, and it was late at night, and I just needed this one tool to finish, and I couldn't find it. This is the story of my life, and I'm going around everywhere. I'm inside the house, in the backyard, in the front yard, in the shed, looking for this tool. I looked for it for like a half an hour, and then I looked down at my hand, and I was holding it. I was holding the tool that I needed to complete the project. How embarrassing! That's the point. There's like. If we're going to see and live into the truth of who we actually are, we have to be able to admit to ourselves that we have been really, really wrong about a lot of things. The Desert Fathers understood this. That is a story they tell us. That once upon a time, a visitor came to the monastery, and he was looking for the purpose and meaning of life. And so the teacher said to the visitor, If what you seek is truth, there's one thing you must have above all else. I know, the visitor said. To find truth, I must have an overwhelming passion for truth. No, the teacher said. To find truth, you must have an unremitting readiness to admit that you might be wrong. This is real case. This is one of my favorite poems. Uh, he says, you know, what we choose to fight, what we choose to fight about is so tiny, and what fights with us is so great. If only we would let ourselves be dominated, as things do, by some immense storm, we would become strong too and not need names. When we win, it's with the small things, and the triumph itself makes us small. What is extraordinary and eternal does not want to be bent by us. And I mean the angel who appeared to the wrestlers in the Old Testament. Whoever was beaten by this angel, who often simply declined the fight, beaten by the angel by declining the fight, went away proud and strengthened and great from that harsh hand that needed him as if to change his shape. Winning does not tempt that man. This is how he grows by being defeated decisively by constantly greater things. So this is humility, you know, and the English words humility and humus both share the same Latin root, it means close to the ground. Humus, not hummus. Humus is what um, is on the forest floor. It's four to 12 inches of rich soil, organic matter found on the earth's surface. It's mysterious. The more you look into it, the more interesting it becomes. Most descriptions of what humus actually is sound spiritual. Humus gathers slowly over centuries. Slowly. It's all right to go slow. It's made up of the decomposition of plants and animals. It's back to the biological process of resurrection. It's a dead thing, becoming alive again, contributing to life of the whole. Its exact makeup and benefits to this day are not completely understood by biologists. I read that it's better understood as a process than it is as a sub substance. Isn't that interesting, you can hold a process in your hands. But it's been observed that all plant life struggles or fails to grow without humus. If it isn't present, there's no life. Humus, humility, share the same root word. Repentance is necessary for spiritual growth. There's no getting around it.
but our brains like certainty. <laughs> we call that stability. And we feel that without it, life would be chaos. And that's a big fear to face and a wonderful thing to come through to the other side. To see that I don't need to hold on for dear life because I'm, I'm, I'm already being held. You and I are more than our minds. We're more than what other folks have told us we are. We're more than who it is that we think that we are. We're more than we can name or even understand. This is my favorite scripture at the moment. It's Colossians 3. St. Paul keeps talking about your true self, which is, again, is like kind of like a little bit of a buzzword right now, you know, your true self, your authentic self. And, um, and when he finally squares up to explain what exactly your true self is, this is where he lands. He goes, your old life is dead. Like, look, whoever it is that you thought you were, like that ship has sailed. It ain't me, babe. But your new life, which is your real life, even though it's invisible to spectators, right, is hidden with Christ and God. God is your life. So be content with obscurity, just like Christ. The truth of who we are is eternal, is not subjugated, dominated, or even influenced by any label, opinion, or idea, and it's here with us now. And it's here in the slowing down. And it's here in the letting go. And it's here in the noticing, the fragmentation and the fear, the sadness, the regret, the shame. It's here in the, the noticing what it is that is driving us moment to moment. The presence of God within here, there is no separation. There cannot be separation. And in the noticing of what's driving us comes the encouragement that the place we're seeing from, if we're able to notice that this is happening in me, that means I am not that. If I can see it, I am not it. A few deep breaths and a return home. Home to what? To where? I mean, even Paul didn't try to tell us exactly what it is. I keep waiting to meet my true self. <laughs> He's going to introduce himself to me. Hey there, Bobby. I'm the real you. I was hoping you'd knock on this particular door. All right, this is real okay one more time, and then um, Katie and Pam and Holly, if you want to come up. Elsewhere, real okay says, no one lives his life. None of, none of us. Nobody lives his life. Disguised since childhood, haphazardly assembled from voices and fears and little pleasures, we come of age as masks. Our true face never speaks. Somewhere there must be storehouses where all these lives are laid away like suits of armor or old carriages or clothes hanging limply on the walls. Maybe all paths lead there to the repository of unlived things. So may we find ourselves at home in mystery. Grateful for the place where we actually are, the people who we actually know, the suffering as much as the joy, as much as the whatever else. May we learn the secret of 
contentment, which is acceptance, which is trust, which is letting go. And when we find ourselves stabilized in the empty space, Let's, uh, let's sing together, eh? Use this time however you'd like. I should say that too. Make yourselves at home. You can stand up and sing. You can sit down and listen. You can find something to write with and write. You can talk to your friend. You can make a run for the door. Just make yourself at home. Mm-hmm.